Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. As most of you know, we've begun a series titled, Don't Worry, Be Happy. If you haven't downloaded that song yet onto your iPhone or iPad or whatever, I encourage you to do it because, I mean, as soon as the song started playing, I turned and looked at your faces and they're just lit up. So I know your jobs are overwhelmingly exciting every single morning, but maybe you need that little extra push to get you through the day. So throw in a little Bobby McFerrin to uh, cheer you up. We're using that title, Don't Worry, Be Happy, to talk about finding true happiness through Jesus Christ. You know, if you'll remember from last week that the definition of happy is a feeling of pleasure and enjoyment because of your life or situation. So situation meaning temporary and life meaning for the long term. And in our study from last week about the greatest commandment, we learned true happiness resides in what? Loving God first, then loving ourselves, and then loving our neighbor. Well, today we're going to be diving into Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Many of you have heard and or read his teachings called the Beatitudes. So if you have your Bibles with you, we'll be studying from the book of Matthew, which is the first book of the New Testament, and focusing on chapter 5. So if you, have, if you don't have your Bible with you, we'll have it on our screens to follow along, right? Oh yeah, that's why I love James Gardner. So open your Bibles to uh, Matthew 5. Uh, we'll be studying verses 1 through 16, or uh, no, 1 through 12. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the happiness that you give us through your Son, Jesus Christ, through eternal life. May each of us recognize that gift that you've offered to us, Father. And wholeheartedly accept it. And not keep it to ourselves, but share it every single day until we see you again. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, if last week's lesson was on true happiness's priorities, and first, loving God, then love self, and then love the neighbor... This week's big theme is this, and it's not in your notes, but I encourage you to write it. Be attitudes are the attitudes. Kind of corny, right? But it works. Be attitudes are the attitudes. Jesus is teaching and describing the behaviors and characteristics of happy people. So let me set the picture for you to visualize Jesus' teaching. In verse 1, Jesus is walking up a steep incline as his disciples are starting to arrive in the front row, while the remaining followers are kind of squeezing in close just to hear or just even see him while he taught. Still other curiosity seekers are following behind just to see what all the commotion is about. So let me put that into today's world's perspective. How many of you have ever been to a concert? All right, most of you have been to a concert. So imagine being in the front row and your favorite singer, let's say George Strait, comes close to your section. And everyone gathers tightly to hear and see and maybe even just touch the singer. 
So you get in the picture now. Jesus is speaking the word of God to his specific disciples, but also to the onlookers who may not even know him yet, may not even have seen him or even believe in him yet. So today at this service, and even during the weekdays, during our community group Bible studies, we study the Word of God. We're equipped and called to offer an invitation for others to hear His message, which changes not only our lives, but others. It's not our job to win the debate for Jesus, because He's already won it. We're the messengers of the invitation for others to hear and decide whether Jesus, His offer, is for them or not. So I want to be an encouragement to you today. Study the Word often. If you haven't gotten involved in the community group yet, please do so. If those community groups don't meet, meet when you can, help become a lead in forming one that can find others that can meet when you can. Make yourself vulnerable to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with a friend, a neighbor, and even a family member. If you remember a few weeks ago, I expressed the importance of recognizing repetitive words while you study His Word. What word do you see repeated over and over in this specific text? Blessed. I've read this so many times before going to seminary, but never asked the important question. What does that mean? Well, in the Greek text, the word is makarios, which not only means blessed, but also happy or fortunate. Blessed as receiving God's favor and happiness as the feeling for receiving God's favor. Let's take a look at the first beatitude that Jesus describes in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now when we first hear this, we're drawn to the word what? What word draws you most? Poor? And you immediately think, is God really asking me to be poor the rest of my life? There's some who also relate this to a complete withdrawal from society. Being poor in spirit means that I should protect myself and stay away from the secular world and just totally withdraw like monks. This is not the case in Jesus' teaching here. In order to put it in better perspective, I wanted to give you your first sermon note. It's not about you. It's not about you. Or me. Rick Warren wrote this in his best-selling book, The Purpose Driven Life. And it goes right to the heart of Jesus' teaching here. Jesus is teaching about spiritual poverty within his people. Not economic disparity, but spiritual poverty within his people. Sin doesn't care about our economic levels. There are drug dealing using multimillionaires as there are drug dealing using homeless people. And as believers in Christ, we must acknowledge our total dependence on Jesus Christ alone to save us. Our simple acknowledgement of our, of our sinfulness should remind us of our humility towards others who may not believe in Jesus Christ yet. But our simple acknowledgement of our sinfulness should not limit nor stop us from sharing our testimonies either. Because it's because of Jesus' grace that covered us completely that He calls us to share it. Jesus said in John 5, chapter, thir or chapter 5, verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. He goes on to say in John chapter 14, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does His works. We also have been given authority by the same Father. And it is Jesus who is residing in us to do His good works. It's not about you. 
It's about Him. It's about His kingdom to share with this community that is so desperately wanting to hear something happy. If you move on to verse 4, you hear Jesus say, Blessed are those who, are, who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now again, we've all read this numerous times throughout our lives. And our assumption has always been, every time, that we're supposed to be these superhuman Christian supporters during times of death, right? Well, in order to be these superhumans, we always feel like we're searching for the right Scripture to console somebody or to give them counsel. As your pastor, a very young pastor at that, I want to offer you some very strong counsel. Stop trying to find the right words to say during those times of mourning. There is nothing in your wheelhouse that can overcome the grief of a lost one. Please, please write this scripture down that says, Please don't use during a funeral. Romans 8, 28. And we know for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. Please do not say that during a funeral. Although biblically founded and accurate, nothing feels good during a time of grief. Love on your grieving friend, neighbor, or family member. Continue to check on them after the funeral is over. The mourning continues even after their loved one has been buried. Be a listener. God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. My wife reminds me of that often. <laughs> And, but despite this sound counsel, this text isn't referring to physical death. I think 2 Corinthians 7.10 defines it better. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So let me say that again. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Remember that part, re without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. So when I read that, and I'd been doing this study, I had an old Tim McGraw song coming up for the next sermon note. Live like you're dying. As followers of Jesus Christ, we should mourn our sinfulness. And constantly desire God's forgiveness and grace on our lives as if, it we were, as if it were our last day on earth. We should also become very aware of the sinfulness within our own community at Seawee Bay and beyond. And fervently desire to pray for and serve our brothers and sisters living right next door. Telling someone that you're going to pray for them and actually praying for them at that very moment is two huge differences. And I encourage you to do it right on the spot. As uncomfortable and weird as it may feel, God's will be done. Telling someone that you're going to help them and actually helping them at that very moment has different impacts on their life. Jesus mourned for the sinfulness of the world so badly that He submitted to His Father and gave His life on the cross so that you and I could have eternal life. If the news on the TV is so disturbing to you right now, pray for your community and its leaders today. Get involved with your community today and share the great comforter with everyone every day. Jesus stated in the next beatitude, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So when you hear that word meek, 
You're starting to start getting a feeling that, great, I'm going to be a doormat for every single non-Christian and even those Christians who say they're Christians. I'm just going to let them walk all over me. That is not what this means. The actual definition of meek is having or showing a quiet, gentle, or humble nature. If having or showing a quiet, gentle, or humble nature, being poor in the Spirit is the absence of pride. Meekness is the absence of aggressiveness. So your next sermon note is, meekness is not weakness. During Jesus' time, the Jews asserted themselves through their race. The Romans asserted themselves through their power. And the Greeks asserted themselves through their knowledge. This teaching must have blown their minds when they heard it then, and still does even today. Although you have the power to overcome an opponent, our intentions should bring unity in Jesus Christ and His kingdom. Although you have the power to overcome an opponent, we are called to bring unity within the body of this community for His kingdom. Ephesians 1, Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness or meekness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. As followers of Jesus Christ, we not only have the kingdom of heaven already, but we're also going to inherit the earth. Revelation 21 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out from heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. And they will be with His people. And God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Praise God when we see that day. But don't you see? Each of us are a picture of that vision right now. And the only way that our community will see the whole picture is if we're united as one so they can see it together. We can give someone a glimpse of that right now. We don't have to debate them. We don't have to fight them and convince them. That's God's job. We have to show them how God broke us and made us new again. There is no one in this world that doesn't want what Christ offers. Meekness is not weakness. It's knowing that eternal life is bigger than this life on earth. So much so, much so that we will, not, we will even take verbal and physical abuse in order to share the greatest gift of all. We can and we will do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Which leads me to the next beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. When I read this over the past week and a half or so, I had this saying, and I, I must be the king of corny sayings, starving for a Savior. Which is your next sermon note. Starving for a Savior. As followers of Jesus Christ, do you remember the day that you accepted Jesus into your relationship? Do you remember that day? It makes you smile, doesn't it? Once making that first step, we couldn't help but not want to put that Bible down in order to get to know the Savior that had saved us from all of our sin and then go share it with our neighbors, whomever would hear it. We wanted to share it because it was so overwhelming and freeing 
that we wanted to share it right then and right now. We couldn't pray enough to Jesus upon our first commitment to Him. But my question that convicted me that I'm going to ask you is, is are you as committed now as you were then? It's really humbling to answer that question. Jesus tells us to, but first seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. And then when He was being tempted by the devil, He said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I've said this once, and I'll say it till the day I die. The devil is a jerk. And the sooner that you get comfortable in saying that the greater your defense will be. Saying the devil and calling his name out and calling him a jerk and telling him to leave you in the name of Jesus Christ is the best thing you can do. This isn't Harry Potter, whereas if you bring up Voldemort, Voldemort will show up. Acknowledge that the devil is tempting you and leading you to places that you're uncomfortable. Call him out on it in Jesus' name. Let Christ cover you. He'll throw everything at you. Some fast-talking speaker or some smooth-reading book about hungry, rather than hungering for the book. Psalm 1, which we studied earlier this year, said, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seats of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on this law he meditates day day. And night. He is like a tree planted by, by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. We prosper by meditating on the Word of God day and night. But we can't hold each other accountable in order to prosper. Community groups are so critical for this, for this one aspect. Sometimes we, there are people who are a little bit further along in their relationship with Jesus Christ than we are. And we need to figure out how to get there. Well, the only way to do that is to ask. And we're trying with these community groups to get you in a place where it makes you comfortable to sacrifice self and say, Hey, I don't understand. And God will appoint someone to help you understand. Our vision is to study and fellowship with each other, but also use that very equipment and serve our neighbors. The devil will tell you right now that you don't have time for whatever reason. But in order for each of us to grow in our walk with Christ, we have to study with a hunger and thirst for more every single day. We have to accept our own inadequacies in studying Scripture right now and seek others to help us get us even stronger in our faith. It's not about you. It's about Him working through you. And these community groups are your outlet to make you stronger, to build a stronger defense against the principalities and powers and schemes of the devil. Not only that's what's in your life, but maybe what a friend may be going through that sees the chaos that's running through your life and sees the peace that you're carrying and goes, I want that. The next beatitude is, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Again, a corny saying that you can remember. Remember the Lego, my ego? Lego, my ego. <laughs> Lego, my ego. When we are slighted by someone, there is nothing more than we want to do than place the holy, righteous hammer of God on them. Amen? Amen. Thank, thank you. We have some people that are honest here. Thank you. I thought it was just me. No. <laughs> we even dream of the scenarios just in case that we get that opportunity when it comes to fruition. Do we not? Or is that just me again? 
what I learned from this study was a question to ask you. How much time do we waste being ticked off at the offender or by plotting our own revenge against them? Romans 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by, by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, become, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Does that hurt just a little? Mm-hmm. While I'm on a roll, help me with this prayer. I think you all have all said it before. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our as we as we forgive them. Does that hurt a little bit more? It's like a samurai sword to the gut. It's easy to pray but it's hard to do, right? So let me give you an exercise from a time management point of view. Try forgiving someone and in the words of Elsa and Frozen, let it go, let it go. And compare that to the time that you'll spend angry, ticked off, or even working towards a plot of evil, vengeance, for a response. Now, depending on which one of those takes the least amount of time, move towards the more efficient use of your time, okay? Does that sound like a good experiment to try out? Smart Alec, yeah. Lord, I apologize. Look back at verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now I see was your next sermon note. As followers of Jesus Christ, we should be reminded every single day that there was a season of disbelief in our own lives and even spiritual blindness. We still have friends of ours that have not given their life to Christ. Are we striving to live a life in Christ to be the light for our friends, family, and neighbors? Philippians 4 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. When you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. So when we wake up in the morning, we not only tell God that we love Him, but we also ask Him to deliver us from evil and be His light in this dark world. When we are in a morally compromised situation, we don't condemn, but we either remove ourselves from it or shine a light of Jesus Christ upon it. It's not easy. I know that. For those of you that were here last week, I discussed with you the situation that I had in my fraternity and the moral decision that I, had to, that I was faced with. But our family, our friends and neighbors are observing to truly see if Jesus Christ is living in you and me. Their eternal lives are more important than a few good times on leave from Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Their eternal lives are more important than a few good times on leave from Jesus Inevitably, when we take those good times on leave from Jesus, they seem to replicate one of Charleston's own Southern Charm shows. We encounter a lot of chaos or volatile situations. Which brings me to my next sermon note. Calm in the chaos. Verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. 
there is no doubt in my mind that each of us see on television and even in our own community that we're encountering an extremely volatile situations right now in the most reading shootings and riots throughout our country. There are a lot of unhappy and hurting people. The sin of pride, prejudice, and hate have reached a boiling point. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we should hear the words of Paul in his letter to the Ephesians when he says, For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace. It might reconcile us both in, to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing all hostility. That's no, not only the hostility that we were going to face through God's righteousness for our own sinfulness, but that's all the hostility that we're seeing every single day that every single media outlet wants to show us. In our small community of 1,500, there still divides among us. But God called His church at Seawee Bay to bring peace within it. Amen. It is desired so badly. But our neighbors are seeking the peacemakers. Why not us? God has overwhelmingly blessed His church at Seawee Bay. He's broken down barriers in an instant and used us for His glory in a short six months time. When Shannon tells you that that principal had never received an offer to, for help, that was God opening that door for His church right here. But the goal is not for Seawee Bay to receive the acclamation. The goal is to look at our brother and sister churches and say, Why have you not started already? Since we're here, jump on and gather and let's, let's make this school a better place. Because that's our next generation. Those young children are the next generation of this country. Are we going to show them the light of Christ? Or are we going to show them the hatred and angriness and unhappiness that we're seeing on television every day? We're not called to change anyone's mind. We're called to love God, love ourselves, and love our nation through worship, fellowship, and most importantly, service. We're hosting the Muffins for Moms on October 5th, and then Donuts for Dad on, Oct on October 19th. We can't be the only church partners for the rest of this time that we're here, which still aggravates me. But I'm confident that God's going to use us as the instigator so our other brothers and sister churches see what Christ can do through His church. It's not a competition. It's about unifying His church into one and making a direct impact for the whole community. And I promise you, revival will come not only to Seawee Bay, but people will start noticing outside this community and say, we want that. But it starts with you and me. We need volunteers for the movie night on October 14th. These are opportunities to become peacemakers as well as sons and daughters of God for our community's broken children and even their parents. God is on the move. I've seen it with my own eyes past these six months when we were doing the renovations here. You have to see it. You're here because of it. He's calling each of us to participate. And I'm asking you to look yourselves inward and commit today. 
Lastly, in verses 10 through 12, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When I read that beatitude, I was reminded of one of, one of my other favorite hymns. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. It's interesting that the bookend beatitudes ensure the kingdom of heaven right away. It's in the present tense. Is the kingdom of heaven. Whereas the others that are in between it are all in the future tense. Which means we will get it someday. Not immediately, perhaps. Denying ourselves, taking up the cross is not an easy task in our world today. Trust me, as a pastor, I get that. Our motivation should always be that our eternal destinations are sealed regardless of the perse persecution or ridicule of today. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're heirs, sons and daughters of the creator of the universe. When we're called Jesus freaks or even mocked for sharing our own personal testimonies, Remember, your, test, your destiny is secure. Be mindful that there was a time that we didn't believe either until someone shared that grace of Jesus Christ with us. Be prepared to make disciples through studying His Word individually and corporately. Praying individually and corporately. To Him in public and private settings. Serving our neighbors through His Word and deed. And lastly, uniting the Seawee Bay community for His will and His glory. Honestly, ask yourselves, what do you have to lose in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? You don't have to tell me, but I want you to make an assessment of where you are now. What do you have to lose? Your destiny is sealed. If our existing relationships with our friends, family, and neighbors are important now, then their eternal relationships should be even more important and even greater to want to ensure that they at least heard the gospel of Jesus Christ while they still walk this earth. The biggest nightmare that I face day to day is that one of my friends or family members looks at me during that time of judgment and says, why didn't you share that with me? That's humbling and convicting. We're all messed up. Take pride in that. Because Jesus' grace made you perfect. It helps you understand what that other person who God appointed you to talk to helps you understand where they're coming from. It brings a humility and compassion that they haven't seen from this world. The world tells them to fill it with a bunch of garbage. More, more, more. And they still feel more and more empty every day. Don't worry about the what ifs. Be happy in the what will be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of happiness that you've given us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask for forgiveness for our hesitation to not share it with a friend, family, or neighbor. And ask for your encouragement to start sharing your word today. May you make these weak vessels strong. And may the lights that may be dim now be so bright that others will be drawn to it. We praise you and thank you for your son Jesus. 
for giving us eternal life, even though we didn't deserve it. Father, I selfishly ask for my brothers and sisters that are here in this room today. You know where they're at in their relationship with you. I pray that your word today was an encouragement to draw them one step closer and do a stronger one with you. And if they don't have one with you, may they begin one today. Lord, bring us revival. Lord, use us as your vessels to glorify your name. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For it's in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. So again, I was once sitting in those very same chairs where you're sitting three years ago. And if you'd have told me that God was going to call me to preach in a small community in Allendale, I'd have asked you to get your head checked respectfully. <laughs> if God can use a weak vessel like me, I'm confident He can use you. But you have to look to Him and call Him and say, why not me? And then I would strongly encourage you to strap on your seatbelt and prepare for the ride of your life. I have more chaos now than I could have ever imagined. But I have Christ guiding me through that turbulent storm. And I see the sunrise every single day. So many people are looking for that sunrise. Why can't you offer it to them?